All right, so we talked about why GDP per capita is not a perfect measure of economic development in general, and even not a very good measure of um, wealth in different, of different nations or how much wealth people have in different countries. So now let's talk about or take, try to take a bigger picture or look at a bigger picture and try to think even if we had a measure that captures the difference in wealth in different countries perfectly, uh, why that would still not be a very good indicator of national development. Like let's say we have GDP per capita at PPP that accounts for differences in cost of living. Let's say we have another better adjustment that accounts for all of the black market transactions. Maybe have something else that accounts also for um, goods and services uh, that are not, um, you know, changing hands, like for example, vacation time, but still adding to our wealth. Why uh, wealth would still not be a very good indicator of development. So let's look at other things. Well, because when we talk about wealth, one thing that can come to mind is the wealth inequality, right? So as I said, hypothetically, one person can have all that wealth while everybody else is poor. And in that case, obviously, uh, the nation would not be very developed because most people can literally be hungry while one person has too much money. So when you look at the inequality around the world, as I said before, the United States falls right in the middle. So uh, it has uh, a good portion of, or its rich people are substantially richer than its poor people. Uh, so, but at the same time, uh, the difference is not as huge as in some other countries. Normally, we measure the inequality with the uh, Gini index. Uh, it was an Italian uh, economist, Gini. His last name was Gini. Who came up with this index and it's essentially a ratio of wealth of I believe it's bottom 20% to uh, top 20% and so it's, it's a ratio in wealth distribution and so when we look at these numbers you can see as I said the Gini uh, for different countries is relatively or substantially different and so the United States is right in the middle of that path. Uh, what is troubling about the United States is that while its income inequality and wealth inequality is uh, relatively, uh, you know, high, but still within the, you know, kind of middle of the range, it's increasing over time. So uh, today, the difference between the rich and the poor in the United States is much greater than uh, it was uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Some people would say, oh, there is no problem with that. Uh, so uh, what, what's, what's wrong with that? You know, rich people work harder and presumably make more because they work harder. But then again, um, other people would say, well, it seems like when you have a lot of income inequality, the economic development actually stalls. And so when you look at the times when America had more equality, so like the 50s and 60s, that was the time of the greatest economic boom. And I'm not necessarily saying that the reason for that economic growth was the lower inequality. But what we see that at that time, economic inequality was relatively low the economy was, gro was growing relatively fast. Was it a cause? Well, we know at least it was not impeding the development of economy. Today, the economic inequality is much greater and economic growth is much slower. Again, is that the reason? I don't know, but it seems like it's not helping. So uh, is economic inequality good or bad? Again, I don't even want to talk about it in a sense that, you know, good or bad. I'll just give you some things that you probably want to talk or think about. So um, there is a game that I play with my students when I teach this class in, in class. And I would ask them, um, can you tell me uh, how much inequality you want in a nation? And uh, try to express it through how much wealth should be owned by the top 20% of the wealthiest individuals in the country. So like if you believe that the distribution should be uh, absolutely perfect equality, then top 20% should own 20% uh, of all wealth because everybody has the same. So top 20% own 20% of all the wealth in the country, bottom 20% own exactly the same. So there is really no difference between the rich and the poor. Or if you believe that the inequality should be very high, then why don't you suggest that top 20% should own, I don't know, 50% or 80% or maybe all of the wealth, while the other 80% should have nothing. 
And so I would ask that question of my students and then um, record them and then show them the results of a study by a couple of professors from uh, one from Harvard and one from Duke here who did that same experiment some time ago and uh, who uh, asked that same question of many, many Americans. They had thousands of people that they surveyed. And they did it um, in three stages. They first asked, how much do you think top 20% should own? Second, how much do you, th or what do you think the reality is? And so they would kind of compare what people think there is, what people think there should be, and then try to make some inferences from that. And I really wish that we were able to play this game live, but I recommend that you record your own answers. So um, record how much do you think top 20 Americans, wealthy Americans own, then record what you think that number should be. And so if you are anything like my students, if you're anything like those respondents, you would probably guess that top 20% of Americans own about 50% of all American wealth. And if you are anything like those respondents, you would probably say that it's a little too much. Maybe they should own more like 35, 40%. So you say, yes, they should own more, they work harder perhaps, they invest more, take more risks. So they should own more than, you know, the normal individual or, you know, average individual. How much more? Well, maybe two times as much, you know, uh, top 20% own 40%, maybe 35. So, but they believe that it's not fair. They should own, uh, they believe that in reality, the top 20% own more like 60% of wealth. The truth, unfortunately, is that in reality, top 20% of Americans own more than 80% of wealth. So top 20% own more than 20% 20 of all the wealth. What's interesting is that while most Americans uh, don't like socialism, you know, in fact, socialism lately has become a swear word, you know, people use it as, uh, you know, uh, basically an indicator of bad taste and, you know, foolish economic policies. When you ask them about the specific numbers, they actually advocate for a system of wealth distribution that is more like what we have in uh, Scandinavian countries, like for example, uh, Sweden or Norway. So um, there is a video that I show in my class uh, that um, kind of illustrates the income inequality reality as well as uh, wishes of people in different countries and changes over time. So for my students, I'm going to upload that file so you can watch it. It kind of gives you some reality check. Again, by no means I'm suggesting that um, the video or the study uh, indicates that you know we should be striving to increase equality or everybody should be making equal amount of do dollars. By no means, obviously, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a business person, so uh, no way. I mean, I don't want everybody to have what I have, for example. I think I work harder and I deserve more. But the point is that at some point, uh, how much more, you know, becomes a question. And uh, do I believe that I should own everything and everybody else should own nothing? No, obviously not. Do I believe that, uh, you know, some of the wealthiest individuals should own 10,000 times as I own? Well, I don't know, maybe. How about a million times what I own? Well, I don't think they work a million times harder. So at some point you would say no. And so the question is, at which point do you draw the line? And so what, what's alarming is that most Americans, when asked about these specific numbers, they draw the line much, much, much earlier than what we, like, they believe when you ask them about the numbers that what we have is completely counterproductive, completely unfair. And so they don't know what is in reality. And so they don't realize how much inequality there is here. And uh, so when you give them the numbers, like, ooh, but until then they, uh, you know. So what I mean is that when we talk about ideolo ideologies, people say one thing, but when we talk about numbers, all of a sudden they become much more, let's call it socialist. And so that's, that's what alarming. So which one you should believe, I'll leave it up to you. As I said, another challenge here is that um, globally, as well as in the United States in particular, uh, it's not even the inequality that scares some economists. It's the um, uh, trend over time. So it's the trend over time. So uh, a few years ago, two years ago, I believe in 2016, we reached a point where globally, top 1% of the wealthiest individuals owned exactly the same amount of money as the bottom 99%. And so that's, that's you know, uh, scary. So top 1% owns now more 
than the bottom uh, 99%. So the the you know that that's that's a you know uncomfortable distribution. So uh, you know one percent now owns more than the remaining 99%. And so that's, that's, I don't know, uh, you, you make up your mind, but in my opinion, I think that's a little too much of inequality. Obviously, I recognize that, you know, uh, ability to become very rich uh, is that what motivates us to create wealth and work harder. And obviously, I understand that that's what drives us and everybody gets better off. So today's poor may be richer than tomorrow, than yesterday's uh, rich. But then at the same time, at some point, you realize that that inequality is not only the consequence of hard work. In fact, in many cases, it's not. In many cases, it may be an indication of corruption and uneven, uh, you know, unequal rules and starting points. And then you think, huh, is that really better for this society? Again, I'll leave those questions up with you, but I'll just, you know, look at these numbers. Now, let's look at some specific interest in distributions of wealth here. So um, let me go to this uh, um, page here, and I hope it will work. So um, let me see if I can. So in case you missed my graphs, as I said, um, um, here is a trajectory of inequality over time. And yes, in about 2016, we have reached a point where um, uh, the top 1% owned the same amount of wealth as bottom 99%. Uh, and so now the difference is even greater and is projected to continue growing. But anyway, let me show you something else here. So here is a very interesting tool, toy, unfortunately it goes only un up until about 2000, but it shows the distribution of wealth in different countries and over time. So when we look at the entire world, as you see over time, over the 30 years depicted on this chart, uh, the world is becoming richer on average. So if in 1970, the most people had what about a thousand dollars per year, now all of us, or a thousand dollars, that's income, right? That's not wealth, that's income inequality, which is different. I hope you realize the, different, the difference between wealth and income, but you know, the two are very closely related, so we will look at them together. And so on average, uh, in 1970, most people made somewhere, or most people, not on average, most people made about $1,000 a year. And over time, this figure was growing and growing. And so today it's a logarithmic scale. So most people seem to be making, or at least 20 years ago, most people were making, what, about $5,000 or something like that, right? So, and the distribution was roughly normal, sort of, kind of. But let's look at some specific countries that are very different uh, from one another. So, for example, when you look at Brazil, what's remarkable about Brazil is that it has an, a very uneven distribution of income. So, in the 70s, there was this smaller group of people who on average made $10,000 a year. Then there was virtually nobody in the middle, and then a lot of poor people who were only making about $1,000 a year. And over time, as you see, everybody gets richer but you still have that gap and it seems to be even widening. So more and more people are making more and more money, but the rich remain richer and substantially richer, almost nobody in the middle, and then a lot of poor people. A similar distribution would be in Mexico, as you can see, in Indonesia, uh, although actually Indonesia not the best example, but Mexico, the United States, uh, Nigeria, uh, as you can see, they, let me unskip, yeah. So Nigeria, again, same thing. So you have a few rich people, nobody in the middle, a lot of poor people. When we look at, for example, Japan, Japan is actually a remarkably equalitarian country. So in the 70s, people on average made about $10,000. There were some poor, some rich. There was a difference. Over time, they actually became more alike and more richer. So now they're making, or at least in 2000, they were about here, so which seems to correspond to about $30,000, $40,000, right? So, um, yeah. Now, China would be kind of a little different in that respect. So again, in the 70s, China was very egalitarian. So everybody was making the same, but everybody was equally poor. So everybody was making only about $100 per month. Over time, China became richer, but also more uneven. So we still have some people who are making only about 1,000, but then you see that overall, there are some richer people and actually quite a few very rich people. Now, what do you think the distribution of wealth looks like for the United States? 
The United States has a very peculiar distribution. So it's a rich country. So even in the 70s, it was on average, people were making more than 10,000, more like $20,000. Again, note that it's a logarithmic scale. So it's uh, 1,010 and 100. So this like scale points are getting bigger and bigger as you move to the right. And so over time, this is how it's been changing. So it's been becoming richer and richer. But what you can see here is that there was this little hump on the left representing a small, very poor minority. It tends to be sort of along the racial lines, but also some other indicators or, you know, some people of multiple races are, you know, um, of different races can be still very poor. And what's alarming here is that that group of people was left behind in the 70s and it's still behind in 2000. And it seems like the gap is even getting bigger. So while the nation as a whole is becoming richer, which is wonderful, but uh, there are not many people in this kind of middle here, but there is a group of people left behind. Are they working less and not deserve more? Or is there something wrong with the system that sort of leaves them behind? I don't know. I don't know the reasons, but again, I just wanted to share this with you because that's an interesting, peculiar situation that we didn't see in any other country. Now, as we discussed, um, it's not all about money. It's not all about how much money you have that indicates the national development. If there was a nation that was able to make the same GDP per capita, you know, the same amount of wealth in one tenth of the time and have the rest of the time just for fun, it would be a more developed nation, right? So, well, let's look at how the United States fares across the, uh, compared to the rest of the world in terms of how much time Americans work and how much money they have. So there is this, what they call the Great Gatsby Curve. And this curve shows um, how uh, people's wealth relates to um, uh, basically their um, uh, mobility, right? And so the United States in this case sort of has the wor worst of both worlds. Americans are relatively low on social mobility. And at the same time, their inequality is increasing. So in the United States, as we can see that America is a little bit, you know, generally, generally, the less inequality, I mean, the more um, unequal the country is in terms of income, the less social mobility there is, and the other way around. The less social mobility, socioeconomic mobility is in the nation, the less likely for a poor person to become rich, right? The more unequal is the society. But there are some countries that are below that curve, and there are some that are above that curve. So there are some countries, like, for example, Japan, where it's, uh, or for example, in fact, Scandinavian countries are the best example, like Finland, Norway, Denmark. Not only they're more equal, but it's actually more likely that you realize your American dream in Finland, Sweden, and Norway than you can realize it in the United States. What does it mean? It is more likely that you are born poor in Finland, Denmark, Sweden, and become rich over the course of your life and die rich than that chance in the United States. Think about it. We always talk about the United States or other, you know, unregulated sort of economies as the, you know, countries of, you know, opportunities. You can be anything. You can be dirt poor, have no connections. And yet if you work hard, you can get rich. So that promise, that's what's been fueling much of the development in the United States. And I, I, I know I see it. I mean, I came to this country, with, with, like literally I had about $50. It's been almost 20 years ago. I, I cannot say that I'm rich, but I have a fully paid off house. I have, you know, two cars. I have savings. You know, I have a very comfortable life. So the American dream definitely works. What we are overlooking is that we almost automatically often assume that everybody else doesn't have that. So only in America, you can become rich and start from being poor to becoming rich. But the truth is that no, there are other countries where you can also get rich. And turns out that there are some countries where it's actually even more likely to happen than in the United States. So if you wanna, if you have nothing and you wanna get rich, surprisingly, you actually, if that's your really dream, surprisingly, you can achieve that dream easier in Scandinavian socialist countries. Like when I learned that, I was like, no, there must be a mistake here. I mean, come on. But then you look at the numbers and that seems to be true.
So again, we can talk all day why that is. Is it a safety net? Is it the opportunities? Is it the equal start? Is it less corruption? I don't know. Maybe it's all of those. And as I said, I love America. It's a country of opportunities. At least it's worked for me. And nowhere else did I find something like this. But when you look at the numbers, it seems like other countries have it equally good and some have it even better. And as I said, Scandinavian socialist countries, Canada, New Zealand, uh, they actually are in the quadrant where people are more equal in terms of in income and where they have a greater chance of moving up the social, uh, social uh, ladder. Yeah. So the only countries where it's really, you know, among the developed countries, I mean, again, obviously we're not looking here at uh, developing countries of uh, Africa, Latin America, but it seems like it's only worse in like Italy and UK, you know, former empires, France, maybe to some extent, or at least close to that, or Spain. In fact, it seems like it's all former empires where you have all those systems of castes and lords and peers and whatever, you know, uh, you know, very rich families who have, have become rich over, you know, millennia, centuries. Yes, in those countries, it seems like there is even less social mobility. And uh, if you are born poor, you're likely to be poor. But uh, really, the only two countries higher than the US among the developed countries are Italy and the UK. Everywhere else, it actually seems like your chances of becoming rich when you're born poor are higher. So go figure. Here is a question that is likely to appear on the exam. And uh, so let's see if you know the answer. No relationship between wealth inequality and social mobility. True or false? Well, we saw the graph here. It seems like there is a strong correlation, so it's false. The greater the social mobility, the greater the wealth inequality. Uh, the other way around. The lower the social mobility, the greater the wealth inequality. Uh, yes, that's, that's the correct one. So um, usually the more equal the society is, the greater the social mobility is. That makes sense. Yeah. And we didn't really talk about this with respect to Big Mac index and uh, uh, happiness, right? Now, again, we talked about the time spent working. Again, uh, different countries have a different amount of wealth, but uh, do they work the same amount of hours to make that wealth? So um, usually what's interesting is that the wealthier is the nation, the less people work. So they become wealthier and they can afford to work less. In poor societies, people have to work day and night just to survive. But as they gain more wealth, they can afford to take more time off and enjoy life. And what's interesting, so as you can see, there is like a clear uh, line that indicates a negative correlation. But what's peculiar about this graph is that when you look at the United States, it's a definite outlier. So in the United States, uh, people are wealthy, no problem about that, but they actually work more. And when you look at this graph over time, it's actually remarkable that Americans work more and more as they get richer and richer. So in most countries over time, as they get richer, they start working less. Americans are the other way around. I, well, I wanted to say kind of like it. I'm not sure if I like it per se, but I respect it. So I respect that Americans work so hard, but at the same time, it's, it's an interesting exception, just something to you know, keep in mind. So. Now, there is another may, way to think about national development, and it's something that the, is called human development index. So this index, unlike GDP, it ca captures more than just wealth. It cap captures all kinds of things like, you know, life expectancy, working hours, education attainment, literacy, access to healthcare, uh, access to libraries, you know, things like that, you know, entertainment. And so you can rank countries on that index and it presumably again captures kind of everything that you need for a happy, fulfilling, um, enjoyable life. Again, you can have a lot of money, but if you have to work for that 24 hours a week, I mean a day and have no time to sleep, I mean, obviously that's not a very good life. Or if you have to do some very, very nasty work and maybe have never access to entertainment or healthcare, again, what's good all that money is for. So, but if you have a good balance, uh, so that would be, you know, like if you have all of those other goodies, that's a good life. And so when you look at the um, uh, Human Development Index, the United States is actually, you know, doing very, very well. So uh, Americans have access to all of those things, but what's interesting, not to the same extent, 
as some countries that we would call socialist. So even Canada has a little bit more of that, but Switzerland, Australia, Norway, and I don't have all of the countries here, but basically Northern socialist European countries, Australia, Japan, and then Canada and the United States. But um, uh, the United States is kind of, you know, towards the bottom of that block of countries. And uh, yes, I mean, evidently money can't buy everything. So Americans do have more money than most, which is great. I like money. I will not kid you. I, I, I'm very much pro capitalism and I want to make more money. But when you look at other things that are included with uh, sort of the package, you know, like working hours, Americans work more. Access to education is extremely expensive, you know, uh, especially colleges. Not everyone can afford them or perhaps has to pay, you know, loans for the rest of their lives. Um, working hours, education, attainment, literacy, healthcare access. Surprisingly, the Americans are sometimes not doing as well as some, again, as I said, what we would call socialist countries. So it, it's still a you know, respectable number, but surprisingly not as high as in some other countries. And then obviously we have countries at the bottom of the list, such as Niger and uh, Yemen, uh, very, very low you know, uh, human development uh, index. So they really have it hard. So that's, you know, although again, interestingly, they like Niger, for example, <laughs> they have a virtually unregulated economy. I mean, like uh, the laws are not working. You have like the wild west of the economy, but evidently not helping them very much. So institutions play a critical, important role. Um, and then some people say, well, maybe we shouldn't be even talking about those things at all. Maybe we should be talking about things like happiness. I mean, ultimately, we want to be happy. So why not uh, talk about happiness per se? Who said that uh, what we have makes us happy? Maybe there is something else there. And so obviously, scientists have been measuring happiness in all kinds of different ways by asking questions. Uh, in some studies, they literally would have like an app. And so every few hours, it asks you how happy you are. And presumably, that tracks it better. And so the United States is a very happy nation. No problem. Yes, very happy. But not as happy as, for example, Canada or the socialist Scandinavian countries or Australia. So again, uh, does it mean much? I don't know. I mean, what is happiness? But at the same time, there is a clear correlation between wealth and happy happiness, obviously. You know, uh, Europe is wealthy and happy. Uh, North America, Canada, the United States. Uh, Mexico is relatively wealthy compared to the rest of the world and happy. Australia and Africa is poor and unhappy. But uh, the happiest countries actually seem to be the ones that have some sort of a social safety net. So does it mean that, you know, socialism is better than capitalism? Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't claim that. But uh, it seems like the picture is not as simple as some people try to present it. So just something to think about. So here's a question that is likely to appear on the exam. Let's see if you can answer it. Which of the following is a sufficient comprehensive measure? Well, if you've been listening to my lectures today, uh, I was trying to make a point that none of them is sufficient. Definitely not GDP, not at capita, per capita, not at PPP, not Gini. So you have to look at the picture much, much more holistically. All right, I'm gonna stop here. I hope you found this useful. Uh, as I said, I hope uh, you didn't take it as my attempt to uh, convince you one way or the other which nation is more developed. Uh, but I hope you will take into account all these different indicators when making up your mind, because again, one of them cannot be sufficient. And it seems like a measure of wealth, especially if it's uh, GDP per capita, is way, way, way not sufficient to make that conclusion. All right.